Hello, everybody. I'm going to start mine with one that I know you all are going to love. It's called Dear Picasso. So I know you all love a, a Picasso, right? OK. Dear Picasso, women do not have both eyes on one side of their nose. <laughs> we do not leave the house in a hat with high heels and everything else exposed. <laughs> oh, dear Picasso, you knew the rules and how to break them. Your offerings birthed from your demands. A bit of genius, you danced the avenue ahead of your time. So, we understand. I actually um, have five pieces for you today. And the next one is um, from the Altadena Review, which I'm in, and it's called Unclaimed. I picked this one because it's out of this world. When we gaze at the heavens, it should be equal opportunity ogling. The citizens of Mars are dreamed of, those famous Martians. Are we blameless that there are few stories of Uranus beings? Uranian stars are nameless? They are unnoticed occupants with acknowledgement needs completely ignored as we look past them. We gave our time and rallied attention to the declassification of Pluto. Well, Pluto doesn't care. It has its own measuring stick and knew to keep a dark distance from Earth. Pluto noticed Earth while mankind was a thought floating in a cloud of dust. Pluto watched Earth before man formed two eyes to even look at the sky. Pluto knew Earth was round back when men thought it was flat. In Pluto's classification book, the other bodies in our solar system do not have beings on it fighting. Neptune's turbulence is organic and sees Pluto's point. Venus strongly agrees Mars is tired of our explosions, and Uranus is not our ally because of our treatment, believes that we need to go get a moon. <laughs> they all rock out in agreement. War makes Earth classified as not a planet. <laughs> my next one is from my first book, and it's true. It's a true story. It's called The Problem With Me, and it goes like this. The problem with me is I'm full of opinion when speaking of everyone else. Yeah. But I find my opinion does become clouded when it's time to examine myself. As long as my finger is pointed, I can find so much to say. Yeah. Then in front of a mirror, all my clear seeing and all my insightful words fade away. I act proud and unshaken, but you will be mistaken to believe the face that I show. My surface misleading. There's so much I'm needing that's shielded and hidden below. When I sum it all up at the end of a day, who am I to say what others should be? Who am I to complain and find fault with others, but not face the problem with me? Mm. My next one is called Just Sharing. And I will tell you right now, this is a true story. It's true to my backstory. It goes like this. Now's the time, I thought. It was an ordinary month of March in Plainfield, New Jersey, when my chronic sadness finally kicked a hole in my young outlook. Thirteen years old, and I was tired of everything. School, the chaos at home. Tired of feeling misunderstood, feeling all alone and unfavored. Tired of my family moving over and over. So, I plotted to bring my life to an end. I picked the time, the day, and I mapped how I would do it. It was my little secret. 
I skipped school on that day so I would have plenty of hours alone to perish before my family returned home. My calculations were wrong, and as the hours passed, my attempt made me increasingly ill, but I was still alive, and I was so angry. So I left our home and took the long walk to a house that we formerly lived in that I knew was still vacant. I climbed into a basement window. I went upstairs to the second story, to a bedroom. I laid down there with my eyes closed, and I waited for my breathing to stop. Then suddenly a message came through my mind that was clear as a bell. It said, you are so young. You are not going to be 13 and end this forever. When you grow up, you can go wherever you want to go. You can do whatever you want to do. You do not want to die right now. The message startled me, and I sat up, and I said out loud, where did that come from? It gave me just enough hope to shift into not wanting to die with what I seen was a shred of an answer. Long story short, I got out of there, and I was very sick. I was dry heaving, and my ears were ringing so loud by the time I walked all the way back home. I sadly revealed what I had done to myself. An ambulance was called, and I was rushed to Muhlenberg Hospital, where I spent nearly a week recovering until my system was clear. Most of the time in the hospital was spent with long visits with my family and very close friends. There was one friend among them who was about a year older than me, and she wanted to know all about what happened. And I told her in great detail everything from plot to finish. Once I was released, I continued to recover at home with the help of a circle of support that I was required to meet twice a week. About a month after my release from the hospital, I heard the news that my friend who visited me tried to end her life. She used my attempt as her model and thought that if she takes it some steps further, it would ensure her success. Well, she remembered some of the important details incorrectly, <laughs> and that was the only thing that saved her. I thank the Almighty that I do not have to live with a knowing that I was an example that inspired her into a teenage death. The strong memory of these events really changed me. And to this day, I am careful to refrain from asphyxiation on sadness or beliefs that disempower. I remain mindful of how I share. And I get reminders that there are needs for caution and how much we share details of tragic or violent events. When I see copycat-like behavior, involving active teenage shooters, I always wonder how many <coughs> new deadly ideas were sparked from viewing coverage of previous shootings? Do details warn or do they teach? It depends on the listener. And I'm so sorry to bother you, but the devil truly is in some details. <laughs> And I'm going to end my set with another poem that's from Mud and Magic, and it's one of my favorite ones to recite. It's called Next. From the beginning of January to the very end of December, life is a continuum. May we remember to remember. There is no platforms on which we halt. There's no arrival at which we're landing. There's only continuous movement. Blend motion into all planning. Next is a good four-letter word that dances on the tongue. It illuminates the playgrounds of our minds. <laughs> Next can call loudly or soft and subtle when it chimes. 
within the cold of winter? No. Next is fragrant flowers and spring. Next reminds us there is no be all. There's no end all to anything. So if riding a high tide or if low tide has you feeling sadness and perplexed, no true muscle can be found in how well you just say next. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Adele. Thank you, Bear Bones. Thank you, everybody.